Well, it's good to see you guys today. I am thrilled because tomorrow morning I'm going to be done with my summer course. I am so tired. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to, and then I'm going to have three weeks off. So that's going to be awesome. What are you going to do? So yesterday my parents uh, celebrated their 39th anniversary. Together. So they've been there a long time. Longer than I've been born, you know, it's crazy. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, I do have a prayer request that I want to bring to you guys. Um, some of you guys know Jessica's grandpa on her dad's side, um, Grandpa K. Uh, some of you know he went to the hospital this week uh, because one of his arteries was 99% blocked. Oh. Um, and God heard our prayers. Um, they were able to put two stints in, and he was discharged today. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so... He is recovering. We ask you to continue. Please pray for Grandpa K to continue to recover. God's still healing people. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amazing grace. Uh, there's a picture of Grandpa K. He is in good spirits. Um, uh, so that's that's him. And uh, you can please pray for him. So we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew. Um, and we've been just seeing how Jesus changes everything. Amen? He is the fulfillment of all of Israel's hopes, the fulfillment of all of their dreams and all of their longings, and, and his kingship opens up new possibilities, right. unimaginable beforehand. Right. That, for, that they've been longing for redemption and, and, and for peace and for healing and for fellowship with God restored, and Jesus and his kingdom opens that up for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. And all that we have to do is, if we want a piece of it, he invites us to his table. Okay. The kingdom of God has dawned. That is what we've been learning from Matthew. That is the message of the gospel. Can I get an amen? amen. With a little more gusto, can I get an amen? amen. Alright, so two weeks ago, we reached the part of Matthew known as the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, it's the first of five blocks of teaching in the book, and it lays out Jesus' vision for the kingdom of God. What it looks like to be a kingdom person who lives the kingdom way. Yeah. And you can turn over in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. We know when we pledge ourselves to King Jesus, it changes everything. We give him complete ownership over our life. He changes us, changes us from the inside out. He gives us true life to the full. But it requires us to give up everything. Okay. We have to let go of what we're holding of to be able to grab onto something else. Right. When it, and, and God offers us more than we can possibly imagine in return. There's nothing more exciting and fulfilling than being out on the front lines of God's kingdom. Okay. I could not imagine this job. I would hate it. I'd be miserable. My wife would hate it. Because she'd have to deal with me coming home just being miserable all day. Mm -hmm. So Matthew chapter 5, 13 to 16. The message today is simple title, Salt and light. Come on. And uh, today I'm going to do something. I used to do this in AV sometimes. Uh, I'm going to read the scripture and uh, then I'm going to give us all a minute to silently meditate. And, and we're going to take 60 seconds and you can close your eyes, you can pray, uh, you can read the scripture over again in your head, whatever you want. And, and I want you to pay attention to what the Spirit is saying to you today in this moment. Okay. And then I'll read it aloud again after the minute, and we're going to share some of our thoughts. Sound good? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Matthew 5, 13 to 16 says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out, trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. 
Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Good. Amen. Let's take a moment to meditate. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. I want to hear from you guys. What speaks to you? What is the Spirit, spirit of God revealing to you as we read this together? Michael, as a disciple of Jesus, I am here to bring labor to people's lives, to enhance their lives, to give them light in what could be their uh, simple life, so that I can shine and show them the love of Christ. Amen. It's wonderful how tiny salt is, and yet you put it in anything, and it's just better. It just feels like all of what we do is just trying to bring that way to it. Thomas, thank God for his calling. Amen. Okay. Uh, we get one more. One more. Yeah, I think it's interesting that it gives light to everyone in the house. Yeah. Uh, I think so often I can think like, oh, I'm going to impact a, a certain few, or, or but I like how it goes to everyone. So there's three metaphors that Jesus uses to describe the people of God. Salt, light of the world, and a town that is elevated. When we began the Sermon on the Mount two weeks ago, I mentioned how the main thrust of this sermon is that Jesus is calling Israel to be Israel. It's this urgent call for God's people to be the set-apart people, set apart to the service of God that He redeems so that He can use them to bring redemption to the whole world. It's the plea from Waypoint by Jesus to be set apart, to be holy, and to be on mission. That's right. To be set apart from the world for God's service. To be on mission. Amen. And really those are essentially the same thing. Because to be holy is to be set apart from the whole for a special purpose. And that is what God's people are meant to be. That God's, that's God's vision for the church. Amen. The gathered people of the redeemed that he uses to redeem people. And the Sermon on the Mount as a whole shows us how to be that people. Right. So bringing it back to verses 13 and 16, Jesus is saying that, that they are the people that God is launching His covenant renewal through. We are the people God is using to launch His kingdom project, His renewed heaven and earth project, and, and, and that's going to be evident by the way we live. 
and by how we reflect God to those around us. That's verses 13 to 16 in a nutshell. So God is calling us to be his set-apart people. Not to blend in, but to be set apart that he uses to do nothing less than change the world. Right. To launch his kingdom here in Santa Barbara like it is in heaven. Because he's not finished yet. God's calling Lawrence to advance God's kingdom. Amen. God is calling Gabby to enact his kingdom. God is calling Todd to advance God's kingdom. God is calling Oscar to build God's kingdom. God is calling Ceci and Beth and Russ to be healed and to bring others to the great physician. And when we turn our lives over to God, He shows us how to be human in the way that He intended for us to. And when we follow Jesus, it frees us to be authentically human. That's what the whole Sermon on the Mount is about. So I want to show you guys a clip from the Bible Project. Next, Jesus describes his followers with a new image, comparing them to salt. Here's how he writes You are the salt of the land. So why is Jesus calling his followers salt? In the ancient world, salt had an important function, to preserve food and make it last a really long time. This is why, in the Hebrew Bible, salt is associated with God's long-lasting covenant promises to Israel. Right, so in that covenant, God chose Israel from among the nations to be his partners. He would bless them so that they could together spread life to the world around them. Right. And just like salt preserves food, the role of God's partners is to preserve the life of creation by preserving the covenant. And this partnership is a choice, which is why Jesus says, But if the salt becomes unsalty, with what can it be made salty again? It's useful for nothing, except to be thrown out and stepped on by humans. According to Israel's prophets, Israel violated their covenant with God. That is, they became unsalty. So God allowed enemy nations to conquer and exile them from their land and stomp all over them. But here, Jesus is announcing something bold to his followers. God is renewing his salty crew within Israel. Through Jesus, they can experience God's covenant blessings and recover Israel's calling to preserve the life of the world. Jesus then concludes with one final image, which goes like, you are the light of the world. A city that is set up on a mountain isn't able to be hidden. Jesus is taking this image from the Hebrew prophet Isaiah, who said that one day God's heavenly reign will touch down on earth in Jerusalem high on the hill. This is a heavenly city, and its light will be like the dawn of a new creation. So Jesus takes an ancient promise about Jerusalem and applies it to himself and his followers. They are the light, they are the city? Exactly. God is beginning his new city, the new creation, right here, right now. And in this city, the whole world gets to experience the goodness of God. Right, which is what he says next. And they don't light a candle and place it under a basket. Rather, upon a candlestick, and it will shine on everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people, so that they can see your good works, and so they can give honor to your Father who is in the skies. So what does Jesus mean by good works? Well, elsewhere, Jesus and his apostles describe good works as acts of service for people in need and generosity to the poor. And this links back to the nine announcements where Jesus describes the character of those who are most at home in God's kingdom. They hunger for right relationships and they work for peace in the world. And as they do so, they bring more and more of the light of God's kingdom from heaven down to earth. So, you mentioned in there that salt had several functions in the ancient world. And, and I, I just want to highlight three of them. <clears throat> Look at that salt, not that other delicious. Not that much. One was that it's a preservative because it, uh, you know, they don't have refrigeration, so it enables life to continue. It prevents death from setting in. 
And if you only, you know, if you need salt to keep your food food good, that means salt equals life. Without salt, and if I can't keep this food good, then I'm going to die. Salt is life. Okay. I don't know if it was like that serious, but you know, salt prevents death. Then there is a, obviously as a flavor enhancer, brings flavor and, and joy to the dull monotony of just bread. <laughs> And then it was a purifier. Think of like saline solutions used to prevent infection. So Jesus is calling us the salt of the earth. The ones who are bringing life, or sustaining life. We are the flavor enhancers. We are the purifiers. So what does it look like to be salty in our context? Just think of some ideas of volunteering in the community, you know, being blessings to the people around us, serving the poor, like going to the transition house, but also the million other ways that we can serve the poor. I think being a part of undoing the brokenness around us, whether that be calling out prejudice and sexism whenever you see it in a godly, non-judgmental way. Whether it's standing up for people that you see being mistreated in your workplace, or, or bigger things like fighting climate change by, you know, not buying the newest thing, and, and instead, you know, just using only what you need, and, and, and not buying the newest thing, but using what you have until it falls apart, and not over-consuming. You know, helping others take steps toward healing in their trauma, like with our small groups, we've been learning how to do that. Contributing to the beauty in the world, that flavor enhancer, art and music and local projects and whatnot, that is part of us being the salt of the earth. Discipleship is holistic. It reaches every part of our life. And we need disciples that are godly and that, and especially disciples in STEM fields. We need engineers who are disciples that are, you know, that, that, that start and work for companies that don't design things that compound brokenness in the world, but uh, uh, that, that build infrastructure and, and benefit society. We need disciples that study climate change and, and how to fight that. We need disciples to stand up for whatever, whether injustice that they see around them, instead of being lured by Satan's propaganda that we should use violence to bring justice or what have you. Another way to just bring the life around us is just godly fun. Like we did this past Wednesday. We had an awesome time at the beach, amen? Yeah. Oh, that was great. We can be salt partly by just living not un, like in an ungodly way. That's part of just being salt of the earth. I think a great way to be salt of the earth is to encourage people. Whether that's spending time over a meal or just being a listening ear to each other. You know, going, let's say someone has an event and we support them by going to that event or their soccer game or whatever. You know, giving each other gifts, thoughtful cards. When I was in, in high school in our team ministry in the Orlando church, you know, we would write cards to each other just randomly. Just to encourage each other. To bring life and encouragement and blessing to each other. And, and being salt requires us that we think more than just about ourselves. Being salt of the earth is something that is outward focused. And, and I, I get so inward focused. I get wrapped up in my own concerns. I... I for one of the examples I gave you, serving the poor, I've only done that twice this year at, at Transition House, and it didn't cost me much. It cost me two hours of my time. God wants us to be the salt of the earth that brings life, that brings flavor, that brings purification. And then Jesus says, what happens when the salt us is not salty. 
What do you do if the thing that is used to salt things isn't salty? You're done. Because you don't have anything to make it salty. It's the thing. And if the thing isn't the thing, then you don't have anything to make the thing again. Unsalty salt is useless. That's a warning and a half right there. Then he calls us to be the light of the world. I want to point you guys to a scripture in Isaiah chapter 2. Where God is, I think this is in the background of this scripture that we're, that we're reading in Matthew. Where that God gives this prophecy. He says, in the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains. And shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall, shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. That is standing behind this passage in Matthew. It's saying, guys, we are the light of the world. Amen. We are God's rescue mission. Right. We're plan A, and there is no plan B. I was just listening to this sermon um, earlier this week from our uh, sister church in Sacramento, and the preacher was, you know, sharing one of those stories that all of you guys have heard before. How there there was this woman who was planning to take her own life, and the day she was going to do it, she got met and invited to church, and then she became a disciple, and then her whole family got baptized too because they saw the change in her. And we can all. Think of a time when you when you felt lost in the darkness. Okay. Yeah. For me, one of those times was when I was transitioning into middle school. I felt like there wasn't anything in life that could truly satisfy my deepest longings. And, and what I thought would do that was having a soulmate. I wanted to be seen and known and loved by someone other than just like my parents. And I was never able to get it. I was, you know, I was chubby and I was kind of nerdy, and I never got a girlfriend. And I was going through puberty, so that was like a big deal, you know. And because I couldn't have the one thing that I thought would give me fulfillment, I had thoughts of ending my life. And there were two things that stopped me from traveling down that road. But one, I hate pain. I have no pain tolerance. I hate pain. So I'd have to find a way to, you know, take my life that would be painless and effective. The other thing was I feared God. Because what good would come from if I were to, to do this thing I'm thinking about and then go to hell? Like, that would be terrible. That'd be going from bad to worse. That would be, that, so I Googled, you know, do people who commit suicide go to hell, you know? And I came across this article, and it wouldn't give me an answer. But it, it ended with a prayer, if I remember right that asking the person who was thinking about what they were contemplating doing to not go through with it, it, it really moved me. And, and I remember praying to God, and, and I told him, God, I will give you a chance. And that's how my journey toward becoming a disciple began. And the Sermon on the Mount shows us how to bring that life. Amen? And it's done through our actions. He says that they may see your good deeds. Right. So being that Acts 2, 42 to 47 community, where we're all one in Christ, how that is when we showcase God to the world. We've got to love each other deeply and practically. And we all know how to do that. You know, by walking with each other and doing life together and encouraging one another with a million different ways that we know how to encourage each other. Serving one another. Forgiving one another. Challenging one another when needed. And, and, in, and being this community that embraces diversity and, and, and values everybody, respects everyone, that changes the world. 
people see that, they're like, what is going on over there? Right. Our actions, we appoint people to God. Amen? They should see our lives and be confused. They'd be like, what is going on with this dude? So what does it look like to bring light, to be a city on a hill? We live the kingdom way. And that in, in Matthew gives us a whole bunch of practicals. Tells us to choose forgiveness in controlling our emotions over anger. He tells us to use words that build up versus words that tear down and belittle and insult and ridicule. Not profanity, not bad-mouthing people, not bad-mouthing political leaders, not being angry and letting your temper get the better of you, but controlling our emotions, using words that build up. He tells us Jesus tells us to seek reconciliation and peace. He tells us to refuse to lust and objectify people. Don't even dabble with those things. Whether it be pornography or flirting, just stay a mile away from them. That is completely unlike the world. <coughs> he tells them, you want to shock people with the kingdom? Stay married for life persevere through conflict and, and marital issues. He tells them, be people of your word. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. He says, never retaliate when you're wrong. And to be nonviolent. You know, shock people by how we condemn evil, but don't fight back, but instead absorb it and allow it to crush us like the cross. Turn the other cheek. He tells us to pray for and wish well of and be kind to people who dislike you. Whether that be, or, you know, like the stereotypical, you know, the LGBT community. Typically, Christians, in mainstream Christianity and the LGBT community don't get along very well. We should have a love and a warmth about us that draws people. People with different political views, people of other religions should all feel our love and our warmth. Amen? Amen. He tells them, give to the poor and, and fast, but do it without bragging. And yes, we should give to the poor. Amen? Yeah. He tells them, pray with humility and simple trust. We talked about that last Sunday. He tells them, Forgive everyone of everything. He tells them to be non-materialistic, to be confident in God's provision, and to be generous. He tells them to put God before everything else in your life. He tells them to not be judgmental, but to be humble. And that doesn't mean we don't call sin what it is, but that when we encounter it in others, that we're compassionate and that we're humble because we're sinful too and that we don't look at people with contempt or think that we're superior when we see other people in sin. And then he also tells them to have wisdom and have discretion. And he sums all of it up in chapter 7, verse 12. And everything do to others as you would have them do to you for this is the law and the prophets. And, and we are brighter together as a community. Not as individuals dotting Santa Barbara, all just kind of being individualistic. But when you bring the community together and that love is demonstrated and acted out with each other, it shines so that all the world can see it. When our light is fading, we need to fan each other's flames. Amen? Amen. You know, we, and part of shining our light, I think, is, is sharing God's Word. God's Word is a lamp to our feet, the psalmist says. And in Isaiah 2, the Gentiles come to Jerusalem to receive God's teachings and walk in the light of the Lord. So we, we hold the power of life and death in our tongues. All that black, that's Santa Barbara. 
little light, that's waveform. We are the hope of Santa Barbara. Amen. We are the Santa Barbara mission team. Yeah. We need eyes that see spiritually, that see the spiritual realm around us. Santa Barbara looks all manicured and, and put together and like a paradise. But there are a hundred thousand lost people in this city stumbling around in the dark. And unless we're intentional about it, we'll have our flashlights turned off. What God wants is us, by the power of His Spirit, to turn Santa Barbara into this. Amen. And that doesn't mean we have to have all the answers. Uh, we don't have to baptize a hundred people in a year. What He wants for us is to shine our light in the dark around us. Amen? Amen. So that means we have to invest in the kingdom. Putting, instead of putting our talents elsewhere in temporary, earthly things, and, and we should also think about, you know, maybe when was the last time I shared my faith with somebody? When was the last time I invited someone to come be a part of this? Because God wants a full table at the banquet, amen? amen. We have a seat at God's table in the kingdom of God. Like, let that sink in. We are going to be in the kingdom of God for eternity. And He wants us to bring as many people to the party. Amen. So that no one gets left out. Right. And that doesn't mean we have to be completely healed ourselves to be able to introduce someone to Jesus in Jesus' body. You know, we, we never will be fully healed this side of the resurrection. But we can invite people to come be healed alongside us. Amen? Amen. Amen. I was uh, reading for this final paper, this final project, and I came across this quote, and, it, and the, the writer was saying, the church should be characterized by the joy of inviting people to the feast God has prepared. A feast that is both present and future. Too often joy has been so subdued that people are left with no indicators to the presence of the kingdom. The joy of the celebration of the kingdom should be so apparent that the invitation becomes compelling. End quote. And I want to I just close us today with this thought to ponder. What is your bowl? What is hiding your life? Is it busyness? Is it fear? Is it self-centeredness? Is it forgetfulness? Just don't think about it. What is your bowl? I want you guys, we're going to take a moment now, and I want you guys to write down one thing that you feel like you hear God calling you to do this week. I'll give you guys about 30 seconds. Write down one thing that you feel God is calling you to do this week. God, our King in prayer. Father God, thank you so much that you have chosen us to be a part of your family. God, thank you so much for the healing that you offer in Christ. And thank you, God, for the ultimate, complete, total healing of us and our world that you will bring to completion when your Son returns at the resurrection. God, thank you so much for your scriptures that give us light for our feet. God, thank you so much for calling us to be a part of this project that you have, this kingdom project. And I pray, God, this upcoming week uh, that we can really just feel 
move, that we can see opportunities to take part in what you're doing. Help us, God, to be salty. Help us, God, to shine bright. Help us to show love to people around us. God, I also want to lift up before you uh, just what we were mentioning earlier, Grant K. Uh, God, we thank you for healing him. We thank you, God, for that being successful. We pray, God, that you continue with his recovery. God, I pray for all the people here, uh, for all of the needs. God, that you will put your hand on them, that you will bless us, and that we put our trust in you. God, we love you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.